What's up, traders? We are live here on Futures Radio Show. I'm Anthony Crudelli. Totally pumped to have all of you guys here joining us live on Periscope and YouTube. If you're enjoying my podcast and the guests, I ask that you please subscribe on the YouTube channel. Hit that like button and also reshare it on Twitter so we can get more people in the room here today because we've got one of my one of my boys. He's really like a big brother to me. And a lot of us know him on Twitter as Pax. That's what we knew him as uh, on the trading floor as well. We go all the way back to the days of the floor. Uh, we actually hung out around the, the same group of guys. We were in different pits, but we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about how traders are their edge. One thing that Pax and I were able to witness was when traders were in the pit, we were able to actually recognize what their edges were. It was right there in front of you. And I think that's something that he and I both took from the floor to the screens. And we're going to talk about that today. We're going to have some fun with this as well. I'm going to ask Pax uh, to maybe share some of his funny stories and good stories from the pit. We're going to talk about what his best trade was, his his transition from the pit to the screen. And then we're going to go to the charts in a little bit. And we're going to talk about Pax's opening range trade. So stay tuned, everybody. Got a lot, a lot to go on. And we are going to take your questions, put them in the chat on YouTube, not on Twitter. And we will answer them at the end of the show. So we're not ignoring you along the way. Remember, everybody, Futures Radio Show is sponsored by CME Group and Micro Crude Oil Futures. They are live. I know a lot of traders that are loving them and trading them. To learn more, go to activetrader.cmegroup.com. Futures Radio Show is also sponsored by Trading Technologies, Trade Station, and FTSE Russell. The Russell 2000 is a key benchmark for small cap U.S. stocks. Be sure to check out the E-mini Russell 2000 future symbol RTY and micro E-mini Russell 2000 future symbol M2K. To learn more about FTSE Russell and their products, go to footsierussell.com. Back in 15 seconds with PAX. Get S&P 500 and NASDAQ 100 by the slice. Just one-tenth of the pie. Trade the tastiest index futures, micro e-mini options with TradeStation. Get a piece of the pie now. Pax is in the house, everybody. What's going on, my brother? Hey, Ant, how are you? I'm doing good. I'm excited to have you here. And one of the things I talked about in the, in the beginning was how you and I were able to see traders' edges when we were on the floor. Everything was right there in front of us. So we were able to learn from traders that we didn't even know. We were able, able to watch them trade, and that was a lot on how you and I developed our strategies. And one thing you and I talk about a lot is how traders are their edge. I think so many traders out there look to try and find some holy grail. They look for something for it, and they don't re really realize that they are really their edge. It has it's it's very personal. They have to find something that suits their style. You and I know this because we tried to be like other traders and, and it didn't work out for us. We had to be our own type of traders. And I just want to start off that with that uh, that with you today and and how we were able to recognize that and really just talk to the traders out there today to explain to them how how traders really are their own edge. I how do I even get started there? You know, it, it's, it, it's, it's 100% factual. I, I mean, I tweeted the other day about it, it, conversation came up with the trader where, you know, it's, I need more information. I need to have a deeper awareness of technical analysis and, and, you know, fundamental analysis, whatever it is, you know, and, and ultimately for me, I always felt that too, you know, but what, not always, but when I was struggling, especially when I was trying to make the transition from screen, I'm from floor to screen. Really, Ant, it's it, it came down to learning how to trust myself. And, uh, you know, I knew what to do. Anybody, anybody can make money trading futures. It's it's not difficult. As long as you can snap that finger on the mouse, you've got a 50-50 shot of, of making money. It's, it's, it's how do we keep it, how do we protect it, and how do we grow it from there? That's the trick. And that's where it comes back down into, into um into my life, you know, into who I am, what my experience is, and how I translate that into my trading now. If if I talk about this a lot, if and I tweet about this a lot, when I've been most successful in my career, whether on the floor or off the floor, it's when my life is structured. When I have structure to my life, my life is less erratic. You know, the 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 the, the um, uh, I'm, it doesn't guarantee that I'm going to make money, but it does put me in a position to be able to 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 be profitable and to be able to, to protect that profit and grow it again. 
So I do have structure to my life. It's important to me, especially on the screens. And as I age, that I go to bed at the same time. I wake up at the same time. I, I you know, I work out, I run, I, I golf, I recreate or recreate, you know, so that I've got that. I've got a fresh look every time I sit down and take a look at the screens. Every day is different. Every trade's different. And I have to be able to adjust to to uh, to the market conditions based upon, you know, these simple sets of guidelines and rules that I've developed for myself over the years. Yeah, and we're going to get into a lot of that today. Uh, you know, because you and I come from the pit, it's funny. Every time I put out, drop your questions below, so many DMs I get are about people asking me about the pit. And it's it's hard to believe that we were there for so long, right? And then oh, it's been so long since we've been there. And because so many people ask me questions about it, I want to stay a little bit on sure. just that visual representation of how we were able to see other traders oh, yeah. and how we were able to see what their edges were and then take that over to what we started to do on the screen. Because I know that a lot of what I built in my strategy was by seeing Praz, Joey, um, Louis Lauder, who was a mentor of mine, oh, Vince. Trick. You know, Ponarelli. I mean, I took so much of what they did uh, and took that into my trading. But you were a great pit trader. I was not. You know, I, I stunk in the pit. Uh, that's I, I went to the screen early. It was the best thing that happened to me was stinking in that pit. But you were really good. And then you had to make that transition. But I want you to talk to everybody about the different personalities that we saw and how you were able to figure out how how PAX became PAX. You know, there's that, that old adage of learning or adage. I don't know if it's an adage, but that old saying, read the room, right? You have to learn how to read the room and you know, fit in in different scenarios with different people in different ways. Um, when, I, when, I when I walked onto the trading floor, I was a runner for Rosenthal Collins. And I started in, in January of 88 after the crash. So the markets were dead. I, I, you know, I, I, I made an attempt at college for a few weeks. It didn't work. So my father found out that I was driving a truck on the south side and said, you better figure something out. So I did. I didn't want to be a cop, fireman, or a criminal, so I went to the Merck. <laughs> um, I didn't have a rich father, a rich uncle. You know, I didn't have any clout. I didn't know anybody. I knew that if I was going to uh, – I'll get uh, – I'll answer your question, but I want to get to it in a roundabout way. Um, I knew that that if I was going to have a career down there, and, and the second that I walked onto the floor, as so many of us have said, you know, that energy was was immediately addictive. It was pulsating. I mean, it was it was amazing. So I knew that that's where I wanted to be. But I had to I, I knew also that I had to earn it. Nobody was going to give it to me. And I didn't have the, the, the family money or the family connections. I knew I didn't know anybody on that floor except for some neighborhood friends. My mother had breast cancer surgery. I was at work. You know, I had my wisdom teeth pulled. I was at work You know, I was at work. I worked hard. Um, now, and I was a great clerk. I was a top step clerk for one of the biggest order fillers in the front month of your dollar pit, uh, Steve Mendez. And he was the one that ended up, I earned my shot at trading because he respected me so much as a clerk after three and a half years off in the seminary, studying to be a Catholic priest in my mid twenties. Great idea. <laughs> Five kids later, great idea. Anyway, the, the point is, is Steve had backed me, but uh, because he had saw that I was able to take in a lot of different stimulus, a lot of different, you know, information and act on it decisively and quickly. Yeah, I, I was watching Goldman, Citibank. I had three or four banks that were my that were my customers as a clerk. I'm quoting three or four people, you know, accurate markets. And now that didn't necessarily translate onto the screens, but Steve Mendez was the first trader that I wanted to emulate. Not because yeah, there, there are some people that have some rough things to say about him. He was always good to me. But he carried himself with a dignity and a class, and he dressed well every day. He didn't just grab a tie and throw it on backwards. He, 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 everything he did, he did with purpose. And when he walked on the floor, you knew somebody was walking on the floor. And so I wanted to be like that. I, you know, as a, as a clerk and as a runner, I would, you know, somebody would tell me, uh, uh, Ira, there's Ira Harris, and he's, yeah, he's a board, of, he's on the board of directors, and he's a big trader. So I'd start to say, Good morning, Ira. My first name is actually Arthur. You know, I, I didn't know that until I was in first grade. And my badge said, clerk badge said Arthur. So, good morning, Art. You know, Harry you have. Good morning, Harry. Good morning, Art. But as as after a year, after a while, they got to know me, and they would you know say my name back. And so I, who is that kid? Who's he work? He works for Mendez. You know, so I developed a little bit of a rapport and reputation that way, and working hard while asking these guys questions. I was able to, as a clerk, I was able to ask Ira 
questions that I ask them now about the macro picture. I was able to ask locals, you know, do I want to be a trader? Do I want to be a broker? Which direction do I want to go? Do I want to be an order filler or a local? I chose to be a local. I was able to make good decisions that fit me and my personality, which enabled me to go into where do, where do I trade? Do I go into the euros? You know, the currencies were were a thing of the past at that point. Do I trade? You know, where do I go? S and P? You know, like Jimmy said last week, he <laughs> walked into the S and P pit. They didn't want you there. The Nasdaq was a very <laughs> new place. Yeah, we had two thousand, three thousand contracts a day. We had a fifteen handle range. 10, 15 hand, 20 points would be a big day. You know, that's when the, the NASDAQ was a very new pit. My daughter, Genevieve, my oldest daughter was just born. I was freshly married. I, I you know, I had to figure, I bartended at night, six, seven nights a week. You know, all of these things that made me a great clerk did not transfer into making me a great trader. They gave me the foundation, but they, when I got my badge, my new member badge, and it said new member on it, I ripped that thing off real fast. Oh, right away. Yeah, everybody, everybody knows you're the new Right guy. away. I, I forget who said it last week on Twitter. Jimmy was talking about it. And somebody said, that's the loneliest feeling in the world. You know, the good, and everybody came into the NASDAQ pit. The guys I worked for to bone me up. Hey, Pax, what are you doing? Yeah, babe, yeah, sell you one. Offer, uh, one at 52, buy one. Hey, you know, they give you, I mean, like two or 3,000 my first day. And I thought, oh, here we go. I got this. Next day, we were 100. The NASDAQ was a C note, 100 a tick. A hundred a tick, a hundred dollars every one lot, every tick. Our seat leases, I think, were thirty-two hundred. You know, I so I signed up for Mickey's class. I I, I actually uh, I saw Mick last night, the great Mickey Hoffman. He came and watched my son's baseball game. He's the best. Ah, uh, he's the best. So, um, you know, and I, I was learning how to conduct myself in the pit. I would watch guys like like Emo, um, Ed, Edmund Mercatici, and God bless him. He's been gone now for. 10, 11 years. <laughs> I learned so much from him. He bullied me at first. You know, a lot of these guys, you had to earn their respect. And if anybody talked to me like they did, not, you know, in, in the neighborhood or on the streets, it'd be a different story. But on the floor, hey, you know, I had to I had to keep my trap shut because he would jam me for at least he threatened to. But when I finally did stand up to him, he became my friend and he became like a mentor to me. I had a thousand mentors. I was able to watch Praz in the pit. You guys talked about Steve Presnuski. I I had so much respect for him. Just he, he would raise his hands half bid. Everybody was half bid. And he got it all. Traders like Ross Deutsch. All, you know, you're never going to see these guys in, in, you know, in, the, in a book. Uh, the real Hall of Fame traders aren't going to be in books. Ross, great trader. I learned so much from him. I tell stories about him. Uh, you know, I, we talked about it on Twitter. <laughs> Ross came in and, and, and said something. Then I got the old Ross Deutsch story. And the old Ross Deutsch story is, you know, don't cover just to cover. You know, the old adage, you don't go broke taking profit. Ross was the first one that told me, yeah, you do. Yes, you do go broke taking profit. You know, we, we talked about that. And, you know, there was also a lot of guys, Stephen Jay, Danny Gunn, guys that I wanted to emulate because they had the experience that I did not have. You know, I went from I went from struggling, not being able to, to figure anything out. I couldn't make a nickel. I had $257 left in my trading account, $257. And um, I, I spent the whole weekend smoking cigarette after cigarette, trying to figure out how to tell my wife that I'm going to have to become a clerk again. I laugh because I, 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 I mean, how many times have I gone through this? Oh. It's unbelievable. At the end of every term of my seat lease, I'm going... Well, here we, go. Uh, here we go again. <laughs> How about, I mean, who can loan me money? I'm toast. I, I'm working. I'm, this is, I want to, I want to expand on something here because I think that the lessons that we learn that are very difficult for new traders now is seeing other traders like we were able to see and then be able to build our own style from seeing that. Because nowadays on social media, I think this is one of the most challenging thing for new traders to come in. Uh -huh. They come in and you see people out there that'll just post technical analysis and it looks great. And it looks like, wow, they got to be killing it. Right. And you have other people that are just talking about, you know, mindset and uh, a lot like uh, you, myself, Jimmy, uh, Kenny, of course, talking about mindset and, and just the psychology of trading. And it's it's hard to actually identify where that trader is 
in their career and why they're talking about it. So like for me, I talk a lot about psychology now because I know my technical strategy, right? So when a lot of people say, well, what do you mean, Anthony? I mean, do I just, I think Merritt Black put it best. He goes, go, go train with the Dalai Lama for two weeks and come back and try to trade the S&P 500. I mean, it's not just about mindset. You've got to have a strategy too. So there's just all of these different things out there that it's so difficult for people to identify how um, someone's doing and then how they could get better at it. Right. I mean, we're just flooded with educators and people on Fentwit claiming whatever. Um, but what I want to talk about with you is, is because we were able to see that. What would you recommend as the steps? Because you made the transition. Because let's face it, we were able to see what the pit was like. I made the transition transition a lot earlier than you did. And I was forced to learn the screen earlier. You did it later. I would say even more difficult to do what you did. Um, so how would you talk to the tech, uh, to the traders out there? to say to them, look it, this is how you start to develop your own style. You know, don't try to be like somebody else. You can learn from somebody else trying to be like them. I think you'll probably fail, but how go to go about developing that type of, uh, their own personal style. Oh God. That's such an important question. Such, such a, a I mean, a books can be written about this. The, uh, you know, uh, Everybody's looking at the same 200-day moving average, 20-day moving average, 14-period, whatever. Everybody's looking at the same MACD stochastics. Everybody's looking at the same Elliott Wave and GAN lines, and it's everybody's got the same information. I've got 35, you know, I, I got I have CQG and a great client, so I've got every study in the world. We're all looking at the same stuff. I, it, Margie Teller, I remember Margie having I, having a conversation with Marge, Margie about this, and she said that everybody's looking at the same 200-day. What's what separates you from them? You know, I was lucky enough uh, and to have two incredibly important uh, mentors in my life. I, among all of these other mentors that didn't, you know, Ross Deutsch had no idea the effect that he had on my trading. Um, um, oh, Jonathan Honig, by the way, I just see him. Great show. He sent me a copy because I want to actually talk about that because it's the it ties into. Oh, yeah, Jonathan, question. thanks for tuning in. I'm looking forward to getting the book as well. I'm going to have you on the show to talk about oh. it. Awesome. I read, I, I got it yesterday. I read 45 pages in like 15 minutes before I went off to, not 15, you know, quickly. So anyway, I had Mickey Hoffman who, who taught me the, the uh, um, uh, you know, who taught us how to get in and out. Scratch is as good as a winner. He would yell at me in class constantly about a scratch is as good as a winner because, you know, I'm not here to scratch trades. I'm here to make money. Wait, scratch trades. It wasn't until the second phase of my career after MF Global failed when I when I had no choice but to try to figure out how to adapt my style of trading from the floor to the pit that I realized just how important that is. Now, I manage my positions different than I think everybody else does. So, or not everybody, but many people. Um, going back to like the Mark Spitznagel sort of a theory, right? So anyway, and then I had Judd Hirschberg. Judd is is the best technical uh, analyst in the world now. I don't, there are only a couple of technical analysts and Judd taught me the basics of the opening range and so many other things, but there's only a couple of, of, of traders that I trust their technical information because, you know, first of all, I don't know if somebody's looking at the right information. Do they have continuation settings up? Do they have the continuation setting? All of this stuff, right? So I've had to learn how to do that myself. I've never considered myself a technical analyst. I consider myself a technical trader you know but not a technical analyst we all have to be able to especially as discretionary point and click traders we all have to be able to figure out what works for us and as long as it's repeatable and it is consistent then we have to learn how to put structure around that in our trading and then also importantly structure around that in our lives I need, I need to spend screen time. I need to be in front of the screen. That does not mean that I need to be trading. I need to be in front of my charts. That does not mean that it's, I, I don't look at charts during the trading day. I don't, I know where I'm going to trade already before the market opens. I've got a plan that I wrote out the night before that I adjusted in the morning based off of the overnight price action and based on my positions. I do my plan even when I'm on vacation. I was away with my family last week. You know, I did my plan every morning. I sent it out to my traders. Um, I didn't trade at all. I know I'm getting a little bit off base, but 
you know, all of these things become parts of, 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 you know, things that I picked up from traders along the way have become part, part of, of who I am today. When I sat down after MF Global in the winter of 2012, and I was no longer 100 lot packs or 500 lot packs, I, I was, I was, you know, one lot packs. It, it, my, my, my older kids will remember this, you know, is, you know, we, we moved from Lake Forest back to the south side. You know, we had to, I had to downsize and simplify my life and it wasn't easy. But I had to then I had to adapt everything that I learned on the floor to the screens. What worked? Not everything worked. But you know, we were traders too. That's another thing. I didn't I didn't just I didn't if paper was at even, I wasn't 95 off for them. If paper was at even, I was looking to buy those evens. You know, I I I, I lifted offers and I hit bids. I made markets and I could move the NASDAQ by myself. Um, you know assuming that Anthony Coyne and, and, and all of the other big traders weren't in there. But that's an important point too. You know, when all of the big traders in the NASDAQ, uh, we would create the markets. So if I was long, you know, and Emo was long and Tyler Belknap was long and Cardell, uh, uh, Ponarelli and, and Danny G and, and uh, Stephen J, if we were all long, the market's gonna have a directional move. We're not fighting one another, we're gonna rally. And that's going to create, we're going to paint the tape and that's going to create some order flow. Banks are going to come in and we're going to rally off of that. Now, if I'm long, Emo's long and Connorelli and, and Tyler are short, well, there's going to be some back and forth and we're going to have to wait for the paper to come in and show us. Algorithms are doing the same thing. Algorithms are doing the same thing. They're battling back and forth every day. They're here to make money. Algorithms are not designed to take risk like we were. You know, we, we assumed risk. We were like the insurers of last resort. Algorithms are not designed to do that. So I had to learn how to go from being a market maker to a market taker, period. That was the major shift for me. I was no longer a big trader. I was a small trader. Explain that though. Out. Explain how you go from a market maker because th th this is so similar to in my journey. And I was on the screen and I was making markets all day in the S&P. I was trading thousands of contracts aside a day for many years until I started getting chewed up. You know, I was making markets and, you know, and it was it. I'd see bids come in. I'd be worked a bid with size. I'd see more bids come in. I'd buy the offers. I'd go a couple of things my way. I'd take them out. I'd see offers come in. I'd work the, I mean, mm -hmm. that's what I did all day long. It was just a game that mm -hmm. changed a lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm so different now than I was then. And that's probably going back to, I'd say 2010, is when I started the shift. And of course, I'm stubborn. It took me a while, but that's not about me. It's about you. And I think oh, that important. I want to talk about just ex go, dive into that more as to what you mean. I think for a screen trader to, to think that way, I always say you have to learn when to take and then when not to give too much, but embellish on that a little bit. We were we were always, you know, we made the markets. Side-by-side -side trading started in the NASDAQ in 99. Um, I happened to be at the right place at the right time with a modicum of talent and great mentors. So I went from $257 in my account the first six months of trading to, to a half a million my, my second six months. My first full year, I, I quit my bartending job. I was able to get to know my new baby and I was able to build a home, you know, that sort of thing. Now, um, I grew in volume as the market grew. I didn't want to get lost in the shuffle. So as, as we, we started trading more, I started trading more. I became a big trader that way. Now, I always traded uh, the, the, the opening range. I always traded the breakout of the opening range as defined by, you know, by the, the rules of the CME, the first 30 seconds. And it was always the same, right? Um, I was on pick committee, so I would sign off on it. And I was served on a lot of committees at the exchange and pick committee was one of them. So I got to sign off on, on the opening range, you know, and as I was trading the breakouts. As I became a bigger trader, I became a market maker. You know, um, uh, Goldman would come in and they wanted they would want to know what's bid, half bid, sixty bid, seventy bid, that sort of thing. You know, when I got long, we'd uptick, downtick. You know, and you know we'd uptick the market to create order flow. Um, we were the we were the market. Then then later on, we had guys like um, uh, uh, Navinder Sureyo. You know, we everybody read that book by Leon Vaughn, I hope. It's a great book. You know, and the, the, the Russian, you know, everybody talked about Ivan the Russian. Nobody knew who he was. All of a sudden, I'm even offering 200 of the even, and I'm getting picked off. Buy them, buy them. They're selling tens on the machine. I'm selling evens in the pit. What am I doing wrong? I'm making markets, and they're taking money. 
So I had to figure out on the floor, I had to start to adjust. Carmen Paolo, a good friend of ours, was the first kid that filled orders for me on the screen. I'm paying Spike a dollar a contract to fill my orders. What am I doing? I refused to buy a headset, you know, because I was the I was going to be the, the dinosaur that sat and, and I was going to fight and, you know, continue to do it. But I, I, I had to gradually on the floor make that transition from being a market maker, you know, being a two-sided market maker and a big one. What's big? Richard Dennis would come in. Jack Callahan, not himself, but his order filler. Jack uh, Jack Callahan would come in, and he'd come in with you know we didn't front run anybody, but he wanted to only trade with a few traders, big market making traders. So he'd come in. I'd see Jack sniffing around like Tippy the Turtle. He'd poke his head up, half bid on fifty, hundred it even, and then he'd walk away. Fifteen minutes later, he'd come in and sell. Now he didn't. I didn't front run, and he knew it. But I created inventory for him so that he can get his stuff done, market making. Um, and also trading the breakouts and trading to my targets as I do now. And now market taking is is when I'm not concerned about that. You know, I'm not gonna stand in front of the paper, but I'm not going to allow myself to be picked off by traders that are trading that are that are taking the free money, you know, in the R, but the R between the, the screen and the pit, you know, as I described, selling evens while they're they're buying tens. You know, so they're buying evens for me selling tens in the machine. You know, I had to, I had to learn on the floor how to do that. I, you know, I realized something too, and last week listening to Jimmy and you, it finally solidified in my mind. I blamed the screens for so much of the difficulty that I had after my divorce, um, 04 to, to 06, um, before I started that prop group. You know, I had... I had blamed the screens. All oh, computer trading had changed. It's destroying it. It's impossible. You know. You know what was imp- and everybody said that. But you know what I did wrong? It was. It wasn't the screens because I traded. I made markets. I traded. What I did was I did not adjust to the way that the ranges contracted in those days. And then the, I made my money and I cut my teeth in 200, 300 point ranges with the big volume. Now. Mm. We've got 15, 20 handle ranges, and I'm buying the top and selling the bottom. And 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 you know, I got you got the the squat box guy, you know, putting that all over the place, all over the world. Pax is buying tops, Pax is selling the <laughs> bottoms. So, you know, now they're all buying them on the screens. I had a bunch of guys ask me. I was in London on the way to Ireland in 2002. We had a, uh, um, I went spent the day with my brothers. We were in a pub in the in the financial district, and I was talking to some traders. Oh, you trade futures, yeah, in you know, and Nasdaq. Oh, do you know Pax? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm Pax. <laughs> They <laughs> didn't believe me until I showed them, showed up, pulled out my ID card. Anyway, fast forward through, you know, I went to the hog pit and learned how to trade spreads, and I was doing really well. Great traders in there, Billy Wren, David Hill. I mean, I got to learn from those guys. The Heffernan brothers made the transition over there, Paulie and Bobby. Uh, David Isley, a great order filler and a great trader. Really, got guys, guys that I have a lot of respect for. I learned a lot from them, but then I had to make the transition to the screen after MF Global had had, had forced me to. I'm tra- I go. I, I mean, you know, and I'm also trying to make up for lost time. So I'm still trading big. I'm still thinking I'm making markets, hitting bids. Mm, that's not the way to make money now. So I had to, I had to slowly pair it, pair it back and and start to trade the opening range breakout take my emotions and my intellect out of the trading, make it more about, you know, the price action and less about me. It's it, the price is paramount. Price is the only thing that matters to me, not time, not volume. I traded for, for Pete Stottlemyre for when he was trying to bring market profile up into the age of algorithms. Um, and it didn't work. The add on didn't work, but you know, I got a chance to sit and learn from the master. That, that guy was so smart. I felt like he was speaking a different language. I didn't understand half the stuff he said. So maybe the add-on actually did work. I was just such a mope. I didn't get it. But and, um, as as I as I learned how to make money again, my only goal every day was to be positive, to be green, right? And then I, I and I, I adopted my style of trading to the screens because I knew that if I made if I made trading minis, there were no micros in. If I made 200, someday that would be 2,000. I knew if I made 2,000, that would be 20,000, and so on and so forth. But I had to learn how to make it every day. I had to learn how to take money from the screens, take money out of the markets. Every price change in every market is an opportunity. 
that price changed from 31 to 41 or 31 to 32. That is an opportunity, 31 to 31 quarter. That's an opportunity. Is that an opportunity I want to take advantage of? No, but it's an opportunity. You know, the way that I picture it in, in my mind is, you know, there's the, 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 the money is flowing in and out of the markets. Billions of dollars are flowing in and out of the markets, uh, you know, different sectors, different, you know, uh, you know, taking money out of the dollar and yen and that sort of thing, right? How am I going to just reach in and grab my end of it every day? I trade for chunks of money. I don't trade to be right. I trade for chunks of money every day. Sometimes the, the style of trading that I have, you know, I had to, I had to, I had to learn how to, to use the market to increase my size. You know, I, when, when I do have big size on, it's not because I come out of the box selling 18 or I mean, 180 contracts or hundred, I start off with a normal size unit. But, you know, in, in, when I, if I start off trading a four lot, and we have a hundred handle range. By the time we get down to some of these bigger levels, I want to have 40 on all the while taking profit, taking profit, and at certain areas, adding. I had to learn how to do that again. And it was completely, completely, it wasn't completely different from the way that we trained, but it was a completely different mindset. That was the struggle. I had to change, I had to unwind so much. That's why I think so many of our friends weren't able to make the transition is because it was, wasn't necessarily trading, it was a different mindset. I think, you know, it's a different rhythm. You know, it's when, you know, Vince, one of my best friends, he and I were on a headset together. Great trader. Yeah. I mean, in the pit, he was amazing. Right. And he gets on the screen. He just, his, his patients were total. He's just always trying to make a market. Oh, I, I and think I think that. when a lot of new traders come in they're just always looking at the screen as if it's just a casino and it's easy to do because you see the action and you see, you think it's opportunity Yeah. and it's very hard to slow that down. And I think there's a finesse to it when you're on the screen, that there is a rhythm, like I said. And you know, I, I, we're going to talk more about this when we get back because we're going to take a quick break. I, I've got a ton of questions for us, Pac, so we're going to pick it up a little bit after the break. I want to go to the charts real quick with you. I want to continue to talk about that, and I want to take all these amazing questions we got from the guests. So everybody, we're going to just take a 45-second break, and when I come back, I'm going to be pulling up the charts, and I'm going to get to your questions. So... Hang tight, 45 seconds, and we'll be right back. Trade the global markets with trading technologies. TT is the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. Now with integrated tools for advanced options trading, cryptocurrencies, and trade surveillance. Learn more at tradingtechnologies.com. Replace your exchange with TradeStation Crypto. Dealing with multiple exchanges is complicated, and it takes time, except with TradeStation Crypto. Because we are not an exchange, we are a broker. You have access to multiple pools of liquidity, all in one platform, in one account, one way. Trade crypto your way, plus earn interest on your eligible cryptocurrencies. Get started in one click. So a couple of things I want to talk about before we get to the charts and the questions. And like I said, Pax, we're a little short on time. So we want to pick it up a little bit. Um, a couple of things I want to talk about is that rhythm. Uh, I think that rhythm is such an important aspect of trading because oh, yeah. I am somebody who finds myself into a fast market so easily. Some people may not know what a fast market is, but basically <laughs> it's just when the markets are outside of their normal volatility. Well, me as a person, as a trader, I could find myself out of outside of my normal volatility very easily by just clicking buttons and over trading. That is by far my weakness. When I'm trading really good, it's that my rhythm is good. Uh, you know, I, I may not execute flawlessly throughout that, but my rhythm is good. Pex, that's the one thing I think that I really got from you going from a, a market maker in the pit to where you are on the screen. It's about that rhythm. Just kind of quickly explain to everybody uh, uh, how you feel about that and, and just rhythm in general in trading. You know, it's it, uh, how, how, what an interesting question. You know, so we, we, and I'm not, and if I start, if I drift too far away from the question, bring me back. Um, you know, I, uh, um, the way that I grew up on the floor, the way I grew up in this business, you know, noise, noise, right? I, I know some traders need a room of quiet. I, I know that some, you know, they, they have classical music playing. You know, I, I need noise. I talked, if I'm not talking to my, if I wasn't talking to my traders in the back, if I'd be talking to myself, 
I'd be yelling at Kramer. I'd be throwing shit at the TV, you know. Um, the only person I listen to on CNBC is, is uh, uh, Sam Kelly and, and vice versa. Fox Business is, is uh, uh, Jonathan Coney. So for me to get into the rhythm, I start off early. The very first thing I do, I mean, and this, I never made my bed in my life. And my mother, my, my ma, you know, old fashioned woman, she cooked for us, cleaned for us. She made our beds. Matt drove my ex-wife crazy. So as I got older and I, and I needed structure in my life, making my bed. And if my wife is still in it, I make, I at least make my side of it. That's the first thing this, that I look, that's very important to getting into the rhythm of trading. My morning routine, I can't get into the rhythm of trading, but I put a socks hat on and I sit down and I just, you know, in my shorts and, and I just start banging away. I have to go through a morning routine to prepare, prepare my mind, prepare my body to prepare, prepare everything, you know? So I stick to my, I get up at 445 every morning, 445 to five. I, I do some breathing exercises like yoga, stretching, you know, that's important as I age. Um, I, I, uh, um, uh, and then I pray or meditate and then I come down and, and I grab a cup of coffee and now I'm up an hour and I've already got, I've already have a few things accomplished, you know, already in the morning. I grab my cup of coffee. I come down and I look at, you know, the price action. I make adjustments to my plan and then I take a shower and get ready for the day. You know, that's that, that is the last thing I do. Now it's, now it's a quarter to eight. So that's how I set the, the tone for the day. And as long as I stay within that, when the market opens, the last thing I say every morning is to breathe deep. You know, I breathe out, I breathe out um, fear, I breathe in trust, breathe out fear, breathe in trust. The last 30 seconds of the day, right before the market opens, I do some deep breathing. One of the things that made me such a great pit trader or good pit trader anyway, was that when everybody saw things, you know, flying around, I was able to slow things down. Things were slow to me. You know, and I, 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 I could hear in my right ear, 10 traders bidding and offering, and I can hear the clerks communicating and left ear, same thing, right eye, left eye. I knew who was stuck, who was long, who was short, who was working with me, who was working against me. Okay, so on the screens, that, 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 had to, that didn't necessarily translate, but what I was able to do through structuring my life in the morning was by the, and the deep breathing was by the time the market opens, when everybody else sees the price action on the dome as chaotic, I see it slow. I see it in slow motion. And so that gives me the ability to be able to take the breakouts and to be able to make good decisions in the breakouts that I want to take. I don't take every uptick and downtick out of the opening range. If I did, I'd be broke. I make good, solid trading decisions based off of the price action as it is in front of me, not as I want it to be. I came in along this morning. I flattened up. All right, well, we're going to go over that in a second, but the, really what it comes down to, to me, and, it, and it's something I've tweeted about and talked about, is preparation is what gives you patience. Preparation is what gives you discipline. And you know, the can pit, I say something about that real quick? I don't like using the word patience and discipline, Ant, because every, nobody really defines it. They don't. Uh, right. And, and, you know, so patience and I, I, tr I tried to be a disciplined trader and a patient trader off the floor for years. I, I, I couldn't do it. You know, our friend Sammy, you know, uh, Vince, Anthony would say to me, come on, pick your spots, packs. Come on, come on. What do you think? I'm trying to piss away money. You think I'm trying to destroy my family's life? No. You know, I just didn't have the structure of my life. And, and I didn't set out, all of a sudden, didn't become this disciplined, patient man. It just didn't happen. I mean, it all happened because it needed to, you know, I, I, <laughs> I mean, really, if I told you a story about how I started to pray every morning, a friend of my father's had a stroke. I was going to the Christ Hospital to pray a rosary with her at four in the morning before anybody else woke up. So nobody knew. Hey, now I'm in the pro now I'm now I'm praying in the morning. I got up and I, I, you know, I was trying to quit smoking. So I went to Planet Fitness when I couldn't afford a regular gym. You know what? <laughs> now I'm working out in the morning. This all turned into this all turned into my, um, uh, you know, this all turned into. My yeah, I mean, how you start your day is so important. And I was actually in a couple of trading rooms and a lot of people were asking me how I prepare for the day. And I just ease my way into the day. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it, when we were in the pit, I think it's such a huge difference is in the pit, you come in, everybody's just talking, got a, yeah. a little game plan right. and a little bit, we'd right. be in there and it was all reactive. It was like we all had our levels, but we could trade in between levels. Yes. And we got paid to do that. And even me on the screen, I got paid to trade in between levels. 
because as we were getting to a level, as a move was on its way, I would consider it on its way, depending on where my level was. I trade towards that next level. And then I trade off that level down to the next level or through that next level. You know, that, that has changed. That's, now that's I, you can't I'm, micromanage things. No, yeah. even even on the floor, even on the trading floor, trading in between the levels, there were I would I would always trade around my position. Whatever my position was, I would scalp around it. But when I went really bad is when I was trading in between every level. That's when things got rough for me. You know, I, I'm over trading at that point. Now, I, I've enumerated things like the four pillars of capital management. I, they just came out of my mouth one day. I mean, I, I just made that up. But the four pillars weren't, you know, I, I, yeah. every trade, if I can't fulfill those four things, I don't want the trade. Number one, minimize my risk. Two, remove my risk. Three, maximize my profit. Four, exploit my profit. That, that's simple. You know, that, that keeps me, dare I say the word, um, focused, uh, disciplined, but that keeps me within my lane. That keeps me, you know, my guidelines keep me, you know, from, and guidelines, not rules. I only have two rules. You stops and pay for every trade. Stops in every trade, pay for every trade. Bingo. That's yeah. it. Everything else is a guideline. Well, I mean, I know we, we, we have a similar in thinking. I say that there are no, I don't have, I pulled up the charts here, everybody. I, I don't have rules for my trading. I have rules for my strategy. And for my trading, I have instincts, like you say, guidelines. But I want to go to the charts, pack because Pax, just because texted me. Ira called me just twice. Ira Harris just called me twice. Oh, was he? Texted me and said, "Oh, I can't wait to have him on I'm live." Following be this great. live, he said. <laughs> so what I want to do? What's up, Ira? Uh, and what I want to do is I want to show everybody. There's one thing that's really interesting about your strategy when you look at the 30 second opening range. And what's interesting is, and I know a lot of people out there have questioned why you would have a strategy based off of a 30 second opening range. I've saw a lot of back and forth on this and Twitter, and I think that they just don't understand it. And I, and, and you and I have talked about how we were so much more active then versus now. And I look at the opening range as well. I don't use it as a strategy, but I use it as something I look at to see where are we relative to opening range. And what's interesting about it is that because it's such a short term indication for you, but it's not a, a strategy that you trade too much. And, you know, it's one of those things where it's it's a short term indication. It's right there, but you're not trading a ton around this. What I want to do, right? And so what I want to do is quickly go over what's opening range for today. I got the S&P up. Um, do you remember what it was? Uh, yeah, I got to think about it. Hold on. Let me look at the market. It was. I think it was something that got to be around. 54 to 52. 54 quarter to 52. 54 to 52. Today's a terrible example because we have Well, let's just, let's just put it up there. So what I did was I highlighted it. Right. So that's opening range. Okay, right? That's opening range. We move it up to two. <laughs> What's the time chart that you have up there? A minute? I just put up, um, yeah, I'll put up, I put up a one minute. Okay. And just to just, you know, like I said, just to look at it. I mean, what I want you to do is just quickly go over how a short-term indicator like this, indication we'll yeah. call it, actually turns into a strategy that you're not trading too much. Okay, so I need I need this, I need a visualization into the market, right? Like, like I said earlier, every price every price change is an opportunity. Do I want to take it? No. So I've got I've got um, uh, uh, the way that I was taught to look at the market is 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 from my my mentor Judd and also from Ira. You know, they all learn from the same traders. It came from uh, currency traders that came from um, the, the old meat guys that came from the old butter and onion guys at the Merck and, and the, the ag pit. So the opening range is the 30 second opening range was um, uh, used for, I don't know, you know, since the 1850s, I guess, you know, um, no, since 1908, since Dow theory was invented. So um, do I need to, do you want to, the history of it, what it means. No, what I want is just a quick example of okay. how, like, look at today and All just right. kind of go through the price action as to how this indication okay. is a strategy that is simple but can be effective. All right. Uh, today's a crappy example because today's tr uh, price action has, is, is, you know, it's not, this is not my sort of a trading day. So I'm trading from level to level. So I call them targets. And I use the opening range as my visual, my 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 everyday entry into the market. You know, I want to be long above this, and I want to be short below this. Yesterday was a really good example of the way we opened, but I'll talk about today. So under 52, I want to be short. Above 54 quarter, I want to be long. Um, when I sat down on the screens, I had to figure out what the algorithms were doing every day, right? And 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 I I could no longer I'm 
I'm not a market maker. I'm a market taker. So I cannot fight the algorithms. I've got to make the, I've got to figure out a way to make the algos do my work. So if you guys, if anybody thinks that I'm making this up, go and look at a chart, a, a one minute chart from the opening range, pull up a volume bar. And at, at 829, 820, 829, 700 contracts, you know, 400, 800, 200, whatever, 830, boom, 12,000, you know, algorithms are turned on at 830. So I need a I need a visualization into the market, and I want to be able to take action on that. So um, underneath 52, I want to be long, and I use four points. It equals out out to be about $200 a contract. Um, uh, F. Caristo, Nikos, I want to take I want to be able to um, uh, pay for my trade so I can remove my risk. So at I, I trade in quarters. So if I'm trading in a four if I'm trading a four lot. I pay for my trade at four points in the S&P, which equals out to be, like I said, $200 every contract. You know, crude is going to be 20 cents, NASDAQ about 10, 12 points. So now that's not the, the paying for my trade is not part of taking profit, right? It's removing my risk. We get under 52. I'm short. The market gets back in above 52. I'm out. Okay. It's that quick. Market gets below 52, I'm back in again. Now, I'm not going to take every uptick and downtick again, but it gives me a visualization, so I'll describe it this way. Think of the opening range as a room, 54 to uh, 54 quarter to 52. Inside of that room, I want nothing on. I don't want to be, I want to be flat. Below it, I want to be short, above it, long. Now, I came in this morning long, so, um, you know, it, it notwithstanding. So under 52, we get to 48, I pay for my trade there. So I'm short four. I, um, when the market gives me at least one point of protection, I raise my stop to a scratch or uh, uh, just inside the opening range. Because the, the algorithms, as you guys start to pay attention to this, the algos are using the same basic formula. They, they're, they're, the, they're not, the market is not gonna get back into the opening range unless you know whatever move they're doing is over. So let's use today's example. Under 52, I pay for my trade at 48. I move my stop just inside the opening range or to break even. So now I've, I know some traders don't like this, but now I'm trading house money. My bottom line is protected. My risk is removed. I've got a free trade on now, and I've still got three, thir two thir uh, three thirds of my, my position left. Now I'm looking for pre-approved, you know, markets coming down. I'm looking for the uh, the S and P to come down to one of my targets, and the first target this morning was just below the pay line at 42. So we get down to 42. I buy one in. Now I'm short half my unit. There are going to be targets for 40 to 42 is not one of them, but there are going to be targets that when I um, that are important to me. 43.24, major target for my work, huge target. And I tweeted about this, you know, back in uh, in in early in uh, after expiration in June, uh, when when June expired at 41.87, 43.24 became in a, an important target for me. I was long from 41.87 up there. I flattened. July 2nd, we got to 42 uh, 43.24. Right. So today's price action, you know, just gave us that paid trade. Gave us that that I don't know what the low is, but. Um, came down underneath 42, uh, what is it, what's the low, 41? Yeah, we got down to 41, so it hit the first target. Now, I'm still short half my unit. Theoretically, I'm not, but theoretically, I'm still short half my unit with the scratch stop because I need to now maximize my profit. What, I, what do I mean by that? I'm not going to trade the every wiggle. I'm not going to trade the noise of the market. The market has to get back into the opening range and I'll get stopped out. And if we get above it, I'll get long or the market's going to extend the range to the downside. And hey, I've got two contracts or I got half my unit on and I have absolutely no risk. Yeah. So, I mean, I just want to do a quick review because this is how I like to look at opening range as well as somebody like myself who does not trade using the opening range. I'm going to use your level as an example. So let's just say that I have a level at, um, let's go up here and let's just say I have a level at 64 and PAX's level we'll use is 24, right? So we'll just, let's just say that that's what it is. That's not the case for me, so don't, this is just purely for an example. Well, good. What, I, yeah. I, good. I so just the going. reason why I, I'm going to talk about this is because there's two things. So that I will look at this as myself as a trader and if I'm trading two-way action, this is the way I'll go about it. 
If opening range today is this 54 quarter to 52, and I think 64, and this is a move, this is goes back to one of those things where I think a move is underway, right? Let's just say we came from 24. I think we can go to 64. We didn't quite get it, and I still think it's possible. What I'll look at is if opening range was the low, we get above it. And this area right in here, I will try to be long up to that area. Right. Okay. Now, if I have a target of 24, or if it fails, let's just say I look at the day and say opening range was the high. Oh, it just didn't quite get there. But maybe that is the top because like we say, numbers are like mattresses. They may not quite get there. That That's pretty close to 64. And opening range is the high and we go down. Well, then I'll be short with a pretty tight stop relatively, right? Very For a tight. potential holder. Not more than a couple to, ticks, Ant. Yeah, to come back down here. So, you know, it, it's just all it does. And this is the one thing I think that people really – I think to think too much about trading yeah. is that they think too much about finding a system of like perfect entries. There isn't I don't, I don't need perfect entries. No, I want to know, should I be long or short? That's and then it. I'm just going to, wherever anyway. I, I feel good where my stop is, I use it and I trade directionally to the next level. Look above here, above here, we're going higher below here. We're going lower. Yeah. So, I mean, that's it. You know, it, it, it. I don't have to think too much about it. I don't like to think too much no, either. Me either. Hurts my hurts my hair and complexion. I, mine too. I, <laughs> off. I need a haircut. So good. I look like a, I, if I didn't have 14 pounds of goop, my hair looked like John Travolta in the 70s. Off I, how do you like that? I learned that line this morning. Not bad. Listen. For an Irishman. Yeah. I was, that's I was going to say that. <laughs> so the um, uh, I uh, I call this something I call my two by four method, right? So after after two attempts out of the opening range, if I don't find the the um, uh, the momentum in the market, I'm cutting my size. So if I'm trading an eight lot, I cut to a four lot. If I'm trading a four lot, I'll go to three lot, or I'll go to micros even. You know, micros are the greatest invention for futures traders, well since the minis. Anyway, the um, uh, after four attempts, if I don't find the momentum in the market, I'm going to wait for the market to become more obvious. Okay. So um, one of the things that's important for me is that I've had to learn how to get, I had to learn, I've had to learn how to be very quick in my execution. And I, so this is to your point, I'm paid to react. I'm not paid to think. I'm paid to think before the market opens. During the day, I'm paid to react to the price action. So I sell 52s, they get bit above, I'm out. They go below, I'm in. I'm only going to do that twice. That's it. Then I cut my size for it, I'm done. Now I'm protected. What am I going to be? If I'm trading four lots, what am I going to spend? Oh, but another thing, I, I, I don't, I don't lose money. Okay. I have, I never have, well, I do have losses, but I try not to, I don't lose money. I spend it. I spend money. Now there yeah, it's a mentality it's, to think that way. It's oh, not easy, it's so but important. you have to think that way. And what advice said to you, I said, if you think that way, you start healing immediately. Immediately. And that's what Mick said that you were a great healer. I'll never forget that. Yeah. You know, but listen, that's so important. I, I have to, like any other business, I've got to spend money to make money. I don't want to lose money ever, but I'm, I, I do want to spend it. Every day I come down to the screens, I expect I'm going to make money. I expect it. It doesn't always happen. I do spend more money than what I make, but I've got to, thanks, Eric, but every day I've got to take, um, uh, I've got to take a look at the market and I have to figure out where do I want to be long or short. Now, this is the second part that I want to say in. When we're opening up in the middle of kind of nowhere, in today's opening range, for, for me, for my work, was in the middle of nowhere. Yesterday was a great example because 43.24 is my quarterly target. 43.24 is my quarterly target. That's it. I, I was just getting to I, I was <laughs> recon. <laughs> so 43.24 is my quarterly target. I know that, that that price right there, I want to be long above that price. I want to be short below it. Below it, we're going to 42.64. Below that, we're going to 41.87. Stops and starts along the way, but I want to be I want to be short below it. Yesterday's opening range was 43.29.75 to 43.27. I took those first couple of attempts to the downside because I don't know when the market's going to roll over. But I, I came in long and I came up came in kind of bold up. You know, I I knew we're opening here. This is an important opening range. I want to be long. I took those first couple of attempts. They were perfect scratches. I didn't spend any money trying to find it. We got above the uh, we got above twenty nine seventy five. I got long. We never looked back. I added above thirty six. I stacked above thirty eight. It was a really good day yesterday, and I came in long. Still, I had my runner on, and I had no risk in the runner. 
Well, Pax, look, you and I could talk all day about this stuff. And I'm going to tell you, we have a ton of questions. And I got to tell you, we've got so many that I got to say, look, at try to keep them as short as possible because I appreciate all of you putting the questions in YouTube. Uh, you know, we can't thank you enough for tuning in. And there's just so many questions, Pax, that I want to try and get through these as quick as possible. So try to just give the answers a little bit quicker, kind sure. of like a, a rapid fire segment oh, that I go. do. Um, and I know that you love spending time and talking with these traders. That's one of the greatest things about you coming to FinTwit. I remember when you did, you're such a you know a giver of your time. And uh, you know today, I, I can't thank you enough for doing this. And I, I want to go through these questions. So cool. let me start with Mark's question. You're going to see him pop up down there, everybody. So... I'll read them out as well for those of you on audio. So Mark asked, how can traders who struggle with bias in their trading help overcome mental blocks trading price action as it is and not what they want it to be? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. No clue. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, all right. So I, every morning I come in with the thesis. You know, again, you know, 4324 above that, I want to be long. I, I just, I'm going to favor the long side. I don't know when we're going to roll over and take 4324 out. So I took those first couple of attempts. I've got a thesis every morning coming into the market based off of the price action and the capital flows and everything that I've learned from Ira and everything I've learned from Jod and Mick and you and so many other traders that, you know, that also have been very, very um, uh, uh, generous with their time. And um, I can't tell you, I really, I cannot tell you what it meant. Just real quick. I cannot tell you what it meant for a kid. Who, I was a yellow jacket, able, you know, clerk. I was able to ask Ira Harris questions and he would sit with me as a new member. He had no idea who I was, but he respected the fact that I asked questions. And listen, the only dumb question is the unasked, the unasked one. The only dumb question is the unasked one. That's an Ira Harris direct quote. Anyway, so trading my bias, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to take the trades that the, the price action is telling me. Again, short below, long above, opening range targets, whatever it is. I'm going to I'm going to start to 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 trade from one side and one side only. If I did that, I came in long January uh, February 21st of 2020 or 20th. I can't remember the date, but I was long at 3380 uh, 3342 3381. I had offers in at 3399. We got up to 3397 half. I scratched those trades, but I got short underneath the opening range and I took those down to, you know, a lot further lower. That was the beginning of the COVID break. So I came in, bulled up that day. We were making, it was like this, creeping highs. We were making new highs every day. But the price action had me short. Well, you know, who knew that the market was going to roll over that far? And one of my mentors, you know, was still bulled up as the market was coming down to the early opening range of, of, of that year of, of 2020, which was 32.31. We opened there that following Sunday night and came through it, you know? So that's me trading the price action and not my bias. Every single day I came in along this morning, um, bulled up, still think we're going higher, but the market got below the opening range. I got out, I didn't reinitiate, you know, I got out for profit, I didn't reinitiate. I want, I want, this is another thing. I want the easy trades, okay? They either work or they don't. I'm not gonna sit there, I'm not gonna buy 54s and put a 52 stop in. I don't do that anymore. I'm gonna buy 54s if it doesn't go, if the market doesn't protect me and then remove my risk, I don't want it. So period, you know, right yep. or right out. R-O-R-O. Yep. -O -R -O. Roar. Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing I just want to quick comment on that is like, I have biases myself. I think markets should do certain things, but until the market proves to me through my strategy that it wants to do it, you don't do it. I mean, it's I, I look at it pretty much that simple. Oh, I use uh, the opening range, by the way. One yeah, thing. as I the use... gauge to determine. Right. I, yeah, sending that's out, kind of going back to that. Sending out Ira's, uh, sending like the Ira's, uh, you know, Ira always talks about, you know, sacrificing some soldiers, sending out the soldiers to tell me what the market is going to do, whether we continue or not. Yeah. Let's move on to the question with Greg. Question for PAX. When do you look at trade off the opening range and when do you opt to not trade off the opening range? Okay. What tells you to step aside and avoid being chopped up versus taking the trade? That's a great question, Greg. It's a great question. And he, he put that on Twitter um, right before we came in. Uh, so listen, the um, if uh, the market comes out of the opening range about 10% of the time on that first trade, okay? And so every morning, every day, I've got a couple of different accounts. So I'll, I'll every day, I'll, I take those first couple of attempts out. I'll take that first attempt to the upside, first attempt to the downside. And again, 
I'm not going to turn an expense into a loss. So if I buy 54s and it goes off and I'm out, okay? If, if I buy, I want, again, I want the easy trades. So I'll take that first attempt, second attempt. That's just something I do. It's mechanical because, you know, those are the big directional trades. When the opening range, yesterday is a great example. The low of the day was made just outside the opening range. Or when the low of the day is made in the opening range, we come out to the upside. That's something I recognize immediately. I want to be long. It's when the low of the day is made in the opening range, low of regular trading hour day, not, you know, all sessions. Um, when that is done, I want to be long. When the high is made in the opening range, I want to be short. Those are going to be very directional trades. Those are things that over time I've seen and noticed that we're going to, when it's not, you know, kind of like I was saying earlier, when two or three of us would be long and two or three of us would be short. You know, we didn't have a directional day until paper came in and told us it was gambling, you know, flip a coin, who's winning. Um, same thing now, you know, I want to trade, I want to take from the market. I don't want to give to the market. I want to give the market my time. I don't want to give the market my money. So if it's not easy, I'll wait until it is, or I'll wait till the market gets to an obvious point of, of reference for me in, uh, um, in my trading. Next question from Oscar. That? What's that? Yeah, that's good. Hey, okay. yeah, I, I mean, it's about environment, right? I mean, you, if the market is chopping you up and you take the feedback from it, Sit. respecting the feedback, I mean, Kenny and I talked about this in the Develop Your Edge, and it really is, Sit. if you, you and I feel this way, Jimmy, a lot of us, if you respect the market feedback, it's telling you when you're going to get chopped up. I mean, let's face it, it, you can't force your will upon things to make them happen. Oh. The market's not paying you. It's not paying you. I mean, I just don't have the patience for sitting there getting chopped up anymore. So for me, it's pretty easy. If I'm getting chopped up, goodbye. Two I'll trades, go play golf. Size, four trades, yeah. Go make a pot of tea. Like I said, a lot of questions. We're going to get to them all, I hope, everybody. So Oscar asked, hey, guys, quick question. How's your strategy changed over the years? Even after you found consistency, were there ever times when you completely changed your strategy? Thanks. Oscar. Another really, That's a really good question, <laughs> too, man. Great question. Um, no. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Oscar. Adjustments always, right? But as Candy says, and I think this is such a great line, be dumb, follow price. Um, I'm dumb. I follow price. <laughs> it's that simple. Um, uh, Jonathan Koenig's book. Oh, God, what the hell was the name of it? Uh, price is primary. Jonathan Koenig's book, Price is Primary. Here, here I'll give him a plug. <laughs> Underneath Milton Friedman, Jonathan Koenig, Price is Primary. Anyway, um, I don't want to, um, how do I say this? Okay, the adjustments that I've made over the years and the way that I've changed my strategy is, is uh, how I change my size, how I size up. And guys, this is, this is, if there's a secret, there is no, there is no magic matrix or golden chart or, you know, um, uh, you know, any, anything. What there is is, and the real secret to learning how to be a successful trader is learning how to size up, size down, or not trade. Go big, go small, or not at all, as Anthony says. I, <laughs> I stole that from Anthony when we did his, his TV show. What a great line. But that's it. So, Oscar, to answer your question directly, over the years, I've learned how to, to, to really increase my size and decrease my size to the point that I'm able to, to always, always be defensive while at the same time be, being willing to spend the money to find the momentum in the market so that I can, I can reap the benefits of whatever the market has for me, whether it's a 15 handle range or it's a hundred handle range. I was gone last week with my family in Orlando, Florida, and I missed these big moves. I was talking to my traders and I let them through it. A lot of these guys caught the shorts all the way from 43.62 or whatever it was, that opening range, all the way down to 42, uh, uh, 42.64. And I posted that on Sunday night. My target underneath 43.24 was 42.64. Somebody put in, well, they got to get through 42.93 first and 43.280. Irrelevant. Underneath 42.34, uh, underneath 43.24, 42.62, and, or 64, whatever. And we got there. Underneath there, 42.35. We got there. Came back up. Bing, 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 bing. Building long positions. So... I've got to be able to, to, to trade the price section as it is and not trade my bias. I think we are going higher. I don't think that the market's going lower. I didn't last week yet. If I was trading, if I was in front of the, if I was in front of the screens, I would have been short and solidly so because the market price action had me short. Now, I wasn't now, trading, so I wasn't there. 
To Let's go up to Dinesh's question. What's the oscillator running on two monitors behind you? Is that order flow? What tools, indicators that define your edge? Dinesh, I don't have, um, I don't use indicators. I, I, I don't have any indicators. I, years ago, I've, I, I cleaned up all my charts are clean. Yeah, I've got moving averages on my charts. Um, it's all I've, moving averages. I've got one with the, uh, the, the Amuku cloud. Um, and then I've got point and figure charts, which show me the point and figures show me, you know, whether or not we put in reversal high, reversal low, that kind of thing. But on longer term stuff. So um, I don't look at, you know, the charts that I look at after the close. Here's something that I think many of you don't realize is that um, we didn't on the trading floor. I was landlocked. I traded the Nasdaq. So to trade crude, I had to walk out of the pit and I couldn't use my cell phone. I had to pick up a phone at a desk to make a crude trade. If I wanted to, to go and print, look at a chart, I had to walk out of the pit. I had to walk to a CQG machine, oftentimes stand in line in front of other guys who were, you know, cracking me in the back of the head. Hurry up, let's go. I want to print up a chart, analyze it, keep it by hand, and walk back in, into the pit, right? So that's when I started to write my plan out in, in, in my hands, that sort of stuff. And that's exactly right, Ira. I stopped telling the market what it ought to do, and I started to do what the market told me to do. So Dinesh, I am um, uh, uh, the 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 screens, the horizontal screens. Those are the domes or the doms. You know, I call them domes. The domes. I don't the care what anybody says. I can't call it a dom. It just doesn't either. work for me. A dom is dom my yellow. Yeah. <laughs> it's not this. By the way, Dom and I golf last a couple. Of weeks. I know you. You sent me that picture. Love that. I, I I know. I love Dom. Oh, I was wearing that shirt. This shirt, I think. In it. Anyway, so. I know. How many times are you going to wear that shirt, Pex? For every, every picture. It's new. It's the second time I wore it. The first one was with Maselli and, and, and Ayala and, and Carmignani. Anyway, um, in, there's, I don't, so I don't have indicators. Yeah. I don't have uh, um, anything but price. Price is the only thing that matters to me. Time, nothing. Price. Let me, let's move on to, I'm going to butcher this name, Shop Haba. Uh, this game is tough. You just have to love it. There's no way. Five years still rinse repeating less losses, break even months, small profit months. My question, how to keep the insanity alive? Oh, you know, Mickey and I talked about this last night. Mick said, you got to be a little bit of a maniac to be a trader. You, <laughs> you do. And, and he looked at me and said, you're a little crazy. Yeah, calm down for the years. You know, one of the kids on Gabriel's team, uh, his dad showed up in a, in a new Aston Martin, sold his business, bought an Aston Martin. And, and, you know, I showed Mick, I said, look at that Aston Martin, you know, don't be an asshole. That's all he said. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyway, um, I, I keep my, I keep my, uh, um, my sanity by, <laughs> I, I can't tell you how important it is for me to work out and run. I, I am healthier at 53 than I was when I was 30. That's something we'd sit around the Merck club. <sighs> Smoking one after the other, drinking forty pots of coffee a day. My Merck Club bill was five, six, eight thousand dollars a month. I had to send it to my office, and my ex-wife would have divorced me had she seen my, my Merck Club bill. <laughs> Everybody was eating and drinking on it. My, I remember her grandma and goes, "Geez, how many packs of cigarettes do you smoke?" It was like eight. Anyway, I remember sitting around talking about how we were we were willing to ruin our our physical and emotional health in order in order to become rich well i did i did and i ruined my marriage i made a shit ton of money i ruined my marriage i, I posted the other day about uh dean you, you know D dean Kalenis is the one who said that um uh um i don't take vacations with my family because whatever i'm going to spend you know on that vacation i'm going to make ten thousand dollars in the pit you know the first thing i thought of when he said that you only make ten thousand dollars <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway you know and dean dean died you know he had a great career but he's, he died young died early you don't know no. and he's a good man no, i want to live to be 120 so it's important for me to work out and i want to be trading when i'm 120. i that's another thing shop uh shop Haba, i don't want to screw it up either i love this job i come i come every day in, before the screen's excited because i do i love it i love it but there are months where I break even, you know, I don't, there are, I don't, at this point in my career, I don't, I don't lose money often on a, on, on a month by month basis. I mean, I do, but it's rare. Um, break even, small profits, but you know, there are, as long as you continue to rinse, repeat and leave yourself open to, to maybe leaving some money on the table and maybe scratching some trades, like, you know, like the, a, a breakout from yesterday, 29.75, if I'm willing to put my stop in for a scratch, 
I might make three, four, five hundred points on that trade. Today I just screwed it up, right? But I love this job. I work out, I run, I eat well, I sleep well, and that keeps me fresh and healthy and confident. Another one of my taglines, CCFF, I'm confident, carefree, fearless, and focused. If I am not confident, if I am not carefree, if I am not fearless and focused every day, I cut my size or I don't trade. Because it's important for me to know that that there's always going to be another trade and it's going to be as good or better than the one that I missed. I didn't I, I didn't care about missing that 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 incredibly wonderful trade that we had in the bond. Shit, I bought the 30-year bonds at 158 spot 28. No, 24. I put my stop in at 158 spot 22. This is just three weeks ago. That was the dead low. I got stopped out at the dead low. We rallied up to 167 when I was gone. That doesn't bother me. I mean, it's a funny, it's you know, interesting to tell it, I think, but I don't miss it because I, you know, there'll be other ones. I don't grab those. Graham, greetings from Ireland in the pit. Did you see anyone go on tilt? Oh. <laughs> did you oh. take advantage? How did you self stop yourself from going on tilt? I'm the kind of trader and yeah, I've seen trader after trader go on tilt and I'm the kind of trader that I, I, I would never, ever, and nobody can ever say that I did. I would never take advantage of that, ever, never. I was always a trader that tried to grab them out and help. There was a friend of ours, Scott, right? And I won't say his last name because hopefully he's listening, he's still trading and he's got a great career, but he ended up, I'll never forget this. I mean, to, to the day I die, and it, it gives me goosebumps thinking about it. He was he was, an, he was a, a Deutsche Mark trader, come S&P trader, come NASDAQ trader. Um, it was a summer day, everybody's gone, and um, somebody, grabbed me. I was in the Merck Club. I was always there. I, uh, uh, not always in the pit, but always around in my office, club, whatever. Somebody came and grabbed me in the Merck Club and said, Scott's going crazy. I, he's just shooting 100 lots, 100 lots into the uh, into the S&P. Can you go help him? I walked up to him and it was, you know, he's got this blank stare and 100, 100, 200, 200, 200. He's just banging them out. Scotty, you all right? <clears throat> I'm all right. I'm all right. How many you got out? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. And, and he hands me his trading cards. You know, they're all disarray. Hands me his cards. Like, you know, he's shaking. And he's still banging out 100 lines. So I called my clerks. I had, I had three clerks at the time. And I called my clerks. And, and they started to figure out his position. Then, then some of his friends came back from their liquid lunch and started to, to get him out. Another time, Kerry, you know, came in. Oh, this was crazy. He came in. Oh, this is actually a funny story. He was a great trader. This guy, he, he and I came up together in the NASDAQ pit. We were both about the same size traders, and we both made about the same amount of dough. But Kerry came in one day after um, uh, uh, four or five Heinekens and six or seven shots of Patron, <laughs> blind drunk, and started selling every bid that he saw in the NASDAQ. Bid, sold, bid, sold. I mean, he was short 700 and something contracts. Sturge, I was walking on the floor. Mike Sturge grabs me and says, Kerry's going nuts. Go help him. So we went up there and and Sturch, I grabbed, uh, how many do you have on? I don't know, I don't know. He was, Kerry was a bad drunk. How many got on? I don't know. So um, I think, again, it was my clerks figured out what his position was. His clerk came back and I gave, um, uh, um, Sturch started to buy his, his you know, I mean, this is bad. He, you know, who, he could have lost 700, 700 contracts is $700,000 every 10 points. Remember, it's $100 a tick. So Sturch went and, and, and started covering it. He, Kerry was so mad at us. It was this was a Friday. On Monday, he was so mad at us because we were like 150 lower. Now he wanted to be short, but he had no idea how many he was selling. He was drunk. You know, I think we left him short 20. He would have made like 100 million. Not really. He would have made seven or eight million on that trade. We got a bunch more questions, Pex. Let, let, let me let me get to this one here. Thank oh, you, Graham me, from me, Ireland. Aunt, give me one second on that. So trading on tilt now. The way that I avoid trading on tilt, and I've traded on tilt too, and I can tell stories about it, you know, later on. But the way I avoid trading on tilt now is is after my two by four, and if I take a couple extra trades, you know, I do. This is silly and it's stupid, but I do it all the time. I stand up, I say my name, I remind myself that I'm okay, I clap three times, I wave my hands out, and I sit down, and I'm a new man. Today I lost my temper a little bit. I screwed up a trade. Uh, one of the, you know, something happened that pissed me off. So I stopped trading. I stopped trading. I got out of my lungs. I stopped trading. I went and made a pot of tea. I came back and told stories. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no worries. Um, Rob, how important is it to develop your own zone, 
trade setup versus trying to emulate or copy others? Oh, Rob, I think it's important that that you find traders that um, uh, that have have been through the ringer. You know, uh, um, Ira says Ira always says two plus two equals five. I saw him write that. You know, that's uh, uh, a nod to Dostoevsky. So, you know, when 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 you are learning how to trade, you know, if, if you think that you can do it on your own, you're, you're, it won't happen. You know, I mean, I, I, that's one of the reasons why I started tweeting. A friend of mine took his family back to Northern Ireland to Antrim. Um, my daughter, Irish dances with him. We became very good friends. He's a builder in Chicago. He didn't want to pay the data. So I started a tweet. I had just joined Twitter for baseball. Um, I think you or Jimmy were the first ones to, to notice. Are you packs from the NASDAQ? Yeah. And all of a sudden I got, a, you know, a hundred followers, 200. And I would I was tweeting my trade self, Kevin. So, you know, Kevin tried to trade just like me, and he couldn't. He had to learn how to adapt the opening range to fit his personality. But yeah. he needed me because I, I I have made I have made literally about every mistake trading futures, not options, but trading futures that you can make, and probably even invented some. I've been on the other side of every outlier that's ever happened. My best trade happened to be my worst trade. I lost a million and a half dollars of my own money, money I didn't have a year, two years prior to that. Within 30 seconds, I lost a million and a half. I was debit $650,000. And, and I, my, my reputation was so strong that my clearing firm allowed me to trade the next day in, until I was able to clear up the debit within a few days. Anyway, you've got to see what works for other people. And you've got to see, and if it makes sense to you, and it is consistent, and it's and 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 repeatable, and and importantly, it's scalable. You can increase your size, decrease your size, and protect yourself by not trading. Then find out how to make that yours. Find out how to make that fit you. This is kind of a follow up on that from Christopher. How do you formulate your plan ahead of time? In the markets and why i say it's a follow-up is because it's like it's your plan right, right? Yes. i mean that's that's the biggest thing i think when i look at twitter and i look at a lot of people that follow some people's plans and stuff and that's great i mean i like giving out my plan i don't expect people to agree with me i don't i don't want people to i've talked about this a little bit i think it's important that you have your plan and i know that you have a bunch of traders that are following you and your plan might not even be the same as them no oh, better be or they're out no yeah no <laughs> true True. Now, the um, uh, I develop my, my the way that I develop my plan. The way that I develop my targets is based on a simple mathematical formula that I, that and, and just a, just simple math. That um, um, uh, and and look, <laughs> it's it's simple math. It's simple fib math that that Fibonacci math that that is that was taught to me from the, the great Howard Green uh, to Judd to. Ira to me, and and I, I had to take that, and I had to learn how to adapt that to my style of trading using the opening range, and I had to make that my own. So every night, I know where I know where I'm going to trade. Now, um, oftentimes, I, I think this is funny. Oftentimes, I have the high, and anybody in my group will tell you, I have the high and the low in my plan. All, 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 often, I mean, a lot. The, the algorithms are using the same mathematical formula too. It's not trading is not complicated, guys. This is not rocket science unless you're trading options that we complicate it yeah chances. the hard part is what you're going to do around it you know i can have the high and the low in my plan but what difference does it make unless i'm executing well you know i'm i'm, I'm screwed remember you you had a guy on i can't remember his name talked about having the high and the low for the year and most traders are going to lose money you can have the high and the low of the year in advance most that was funny lose money he said that he said if every trader walked into the year knowing the high and the low he goes his his bet would be that still a lot of them would still lose money. <laughs> that was funny. I've, I've heard that for yeah. years. It's a truth. We're just so eager, and, and you, gotta, you know, gotta you got to trade every price. You got to catch every wiggle. Got to catch every move. Every wiggle. Got to hey, scalp the noise. Good idea. Let's sell them at thirty two. Buy them at twenty eight. No, thank you. I got a plan, and I know I mean I'm going to execute that plan. So it doesn't matter if I have behind the low in my plan. You know. Unless I've unless I've executed it, there we go. You know, I, I have a, a a thing that I say retweet me. I have behind the plan, retweet it. Who cares if I didn't execute and the traders in my group did not execute that plan? Then it doesn't matter. It's useless. All it is is numbers written down on a page. 
A lot of these questions are coming in are pretty similar. I think that um, I'm going to go to this one right here. I like this one, actually, because I think this goes back to kind of the strategy. Do you use opening range of the year as a longer time frame gauge? I That's do. A good one. Oh, it's yeah. a great question. The early opening range this year is 3748. Uh, December uh, in the S&P, uh, 3748. NASDAQ is 12880. Now, December's uh, expiration prices. Expiration, you're not going to find these on charts, guys. Not on charts. But the, the contract expiration becomes my pivot. So, so hold on, let me go to the chart real quick for this, Pax. What, uh, what is it? What is the opening range for the year? Do I go to the daily? Do you remember yes. what it was? Yeah, 3748 in the S&P. 3748. So just, is it just one price? Yeah, no. this year it just happened to be one price. So the, the last traded price, I, I've never seen it that. I've never seen that before. It's always a range. 37.48 was where they settled out um, uh, 2020, and 37.48 didn't change, you know, maybe 38.48 half or whatever, but 37.48 was where they settled out um, the December contract of 2020, and it's where we opened the very first trade on the Sunday night reopen um, January 1st or whatever it was. So I'm long. I, that's that, by the way, is one of the only times that I'm going to initiate a trade outside of regular trading hours is on on the yearly and the quarterly reopens. So above 37.48, I'm long below and I'm short. Uh, uh, we have, if you look at it, you know, 39.12 was a, my target in the S&P based off of September and December's expiration prices, not not the last traded price, but expiration. This, the Merck settles the contracts according to, uh, you know, some sort of a formula. And so um, those expiration prices become pivots and then they generate targets. And 39.12 from December 20th was my upside target. So above 37.48, I was long on a longer term basis up to 39.12. I flatten when we get up there, the only price I'll flatten at. And underneath there, I'm short again to 39.12. When we get, I flatten there, we get below it. And I believe the low that we made, I believe it was January, was 36.56. It was a Sunday night. And I did a YouTube conversation. It's actually up there. Um, I wasn't short then, but many traders were in our group. And um, um, what's know, the target to target? Yeah, I was going to say, what is your highest on target for, for right now above where we are? 45.42. So that's 45.42. I just want to put that up there. I think so he is going to at least 45, 42. Got it. And so what's interesting on this is that what I, what I, you know, when you look at something like this and obviously these are extremely wide levels, but this just leads me back to why the opening range, I like it and why it could be such a short term indicator, but allow you to hold trades for a long period of time and not be somebody who's over trading is because let's just say that Pax, obviously he just said, he thinks that we can go to 45, 42. It gives him, if we start to run and make new highs, it gives him a visual of where he thinks the market may go. It may not go there, but he, in his mind, is looking at that saying, that's somewhere we can go. And if it stops there and starts to come back down, it's kind of confirmation, right, Pax, that maybe now you could be short for a period of time if it holds that level and you watch the reactions, things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Most definitely. So, and that, that's, that's also why having more than one account helps, you know, but I can be short in one along in another. I'm but, gonna take. Oh no! Go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish. Say, you know, I, um, my my yearly upside target is going to be 40, 45, 42. I think that the the break that we had last week, there was so there was so much. I saw it. So much panic on Twitter. We're oh, it's crazy. We're going. We're going to zero. Um, we very well may go to zero, but not now. You know, <laughs> that was that was a pressure release break, and I think that we needed that. You know, that that reversal on on to, in order to be able to to start that next leg up. But but. If we don't get that next next leg up, that's my thesis, right? I'm not going to trade it. That'll be my bias. But if we don't get that next leg up and we stop here for some reason, I've got the price action that will get me short. Price is paramount. Yeah. So you got the longer term stuff that you keep in the back of your mind and you got the shorter term with the opening range trade on a daily basis that leads you to these next you know, areas that you think the market could go. Uh, and trade. And we're, this is going to be the final question for today. I think it's a great question to, to end today's conversation. Danielle, I, I probably said it wrong, it's, uh, but that's okay. Thank you for the question. Any advice in following a strategy? Seem to be stuck in a mode where I'm not following my strategy, which I know works. Mm. It's good that he believes in it. He's confident in it. Mm. 
which leads losses which shouldn't have happened. I've lived, I've lived that. I've starred in that. I wrote that movie. I directed that movie, and I starred in that movie way too many times than I want to count. I know, you know. Oh my God, that's why I started to trade in. In um, oh my gosh, uh, that's why I started to trade in in uh, um, unit size, like quarters. You know, because I, I would get long out of the opening range. I pay for the trade, and boom, I'm flat. Now I, you know, I'd be up a thousand dollars, and now I, I give back two or three thousand, just trying to reinitiate that initial target. Now, I, and I see the market head up to 45, 42, and I've got nothing on. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I, and I'm down money, you know? So by the time the market, how, how many times have, have any of us done this that experience? So I've got to wire money into my trading account because I traded <laughs> like a doom cough. Meanwhile, the market's good, doing exactly what I planned on and thought it would do, right? Anyway, to, to not make a, a good answer, a long answer like I have all day, I'm sorry for that. When you find yourself stuck and, and you know you're not following, do something different. You know, if you know that your your strategy works and you are not living in, in your guidelines, get up and I don't mean do something different trading. I mean, do something different with your life. Take a few days off. If you golf, golf. If you run, run. If you work out, work out. If you play cards, play cards. If you, I don't know, find something to do, get up, clear your head. I was, I needed last week's vacation in the worst way. I've had a bunch of health issues I've been dealing with for the last few years, which crystallized again this year. And, and then others, including COVID and all kinds of stuff is, you know, um, this then I've been traveling for my son's baseball since basically June. I haven't really worked all, I haven't traded a lot. I've been in the room with my traders every day, but I haven't traded. Um, anyway, the, um, I, I knew because I, I, you know, not great months, but I needed to, to, to get up and take some time away. I got a phone call right before, at the airport. I'm in vacation mode. I get, in there, I, I get a phone call that, that I overreacted to. It's somebody I love and care an awful lot about. And, you know, I acted like an asshole. That's what I knew. Holy cow. I need a vacation. I need to do something different. You know, the, term, the word recreate or recreate. Recreate. I got to recreate. You know, that's, a, that's like a corny word that only squares use when we were kids. Um, but, it, you know, the word recreate, I, I need to recreate myself every day. I need to recreate every day. I need to recreate every day. I need to spend time with my kids. I need to spend time with the people I love. I, I need to work out. I need to take care of my mental health. I need to pray. I need to meditate. I need to breathe. I need to stretch. I need to do everything. And when, I, when I'm able to do that, then I'm, I'm able to judge whether or not I'm confident, carefree, fearless, and focused. And if I am, then I'll stay more. I am more likely to stay true to my process, which I know works, and then continue to go. So just keep working. And if you find yourself stuck, do something different. This is the, guys, this is the greatest job in the world. There's nothing like this. Oh, don't, holy cow. Oh, every time I see Leo, oh, I, I got an oh, Anthony, I got an email from Leo. Leo, you, <laughs> Leo Malamid emailed me this morning. Not, not, not Nancy, but Leo. Oh, God. I gotta, I'll call you as both to talk about it. Uh, like every time I saw Leo or I see Leo, I thank him. Or Ira, for God's sakes. Guys, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for people like Ira not, Harris. The, no, we, I didn't want electronic trading. I wanted to stay in the pit. The world was changing. Ira pushed through uh, the, the whole thing. The, the reason we're here be trading electronically is because of people like that. Know that. Know the history of what we do and why we do it. All right. I'm getting off base on that question. But this is the greatest greatest job in the world that's also one of the toughest you know that's that's what's so great about it is that we get to the point where we know that's the only thing we want to do and then it fights back at us or we fight ourselves right i mean it's probably more we're fighting ourselves and you know you know markets obviously can have really tough environments <laughs> And then you got to have the will and the want to, to, to stay in it and figure it out. I mean, oh. one of the best advice I ever got from, from my parents was I was struggling with this. I go to my dad and I say, everything I'm doing right now, I feel like it's right, but it just, it's not working. I'm not making money. It's it, this business is just driving me crazy. I don't know what to say. I think it's almost impossible to make money. My dad goes, figure it out. But my dad told me to go drive a truck. Well, I go yeah, well, I mean, he told me that probably on a different time, but he's just like, figure it out. You know, and you know, it's it's like you think about it, and it's like he goes, if you love it that much, Tone, figure it out. You can figure it out. You're smart enough. You know I mean, what? that's 
That's the difference, right? I mean, yeah. if you love this business, it's the greatest business. Make it work. You got to find a way to make it work. Okay. How I made it work, how you make it work, how Ira, how different. all these other guys, it's all different. I mean, it's all different paths. I'm and a better trader now. I'm a better trader now today than what I ever have been. I'll never make the kind of money that we did on the floor. You know what? It's so funny you say that. It, it's like I – this is why I, I look back at the time when we were in the pit when it was super busy, at least when I had first started. It's like if I was the trader I am now back then, whoo, oh. it's just – I mean – but you had to go through it, and you know, and you and I talked. Two hundred, I know, and but that's the way this works, right? And we had to put the time in to get ourselves positioned to be able to make money when the time is right for us. I mean, think about this, all of you traders out there, is like right now or whatever time you're going through or wherever you are in your journey. It's it could be tough, it could be great. As time goes by, you take that experience. There's going to be a time, a moment in the market where everything just clicks. You may not think that's the case now, but at some point it will. And you've got to be present for it. You've got to be in the biz business to be able to do that. Because for me, my best years were 07, 08, you know, and I, or 06, 07, 08, probably Bad three of my top, you know, and I look at it and those years were amazing for me. And prior to that, I was working at night doing whatever I could for many years into the business. And so you don't know when it's going to come. But you've got to be in the business long enough to be able to experience that opportunity. It'll Most come. people shoot themselves in the foot too soon. You know, I actually got uh, asked a question the other day, and I'm going to ask you with this. I know that was the last question we're going to take from everybody. But somebody said, what would be the advice I give to new traders today? And one of the things I talked about was no. how everybody's expectations are so high. And you talked about this a little bit today. You said that Pax was a 100-lot trader, then he was a 10-lot trader, then he was a 1-lot trader. I was the same way. I'm clipping 500-lot minis. Next day, I'm clipping 5-lot minis, and the pressure felt the same because at the time I was clipping 500, I was as good as I could be. I had the money. When I was clipping 5-lots, I was on a losing streak that I felt that would never end. But I had to recognize that I was there, and I wanted to exist long enough. You've got to be able to be honest with yourself where you are, and your expectations have to be, you know, you can't put expectations in front of, of time in this business because that will take you out of this business. So, I mean, that's just something that it's one of the many things I would say to new traders, but I think that that's important. I don't know what your thought is on that. And we're going to leave on that. I, 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 that that's, you know what makes Tudor Jones such a great trader is Tudor Jones is defensive on every one of his trades. He protects himself on every trade. And because he protects himself on every trade, you know, he's going to, he, he has these huge trades. Listen, spend the time, the effort, invest in your business. I don't know how you guys, I don't know how new traders find good mentors anymore, but find a good mentor. And when you find one, cherish that relationship and stick to it because, you know, it's, it's every, all of our journeys are different. There are going to be similarities, but there's going to be a lot of differences. And, you know, when, when things start to click and you're in the rhythm and you've got the price, you know, for me, I got, I have the price action, you know, the price action has me long or short. My technicals are, are agreeing with me. And now the story is agreeing with me. Oh, that's when you have these, not just those three or four days that make your month or those four or five weeks, depending on volatility that make your quarter or those few months worth of trades that make your year. But every trader will have those career making trades that might last a, a day or a week or a month that make your career. Everything else in between that is defensive trading, which gives us money that we can pull out of the market every day. But be there for those days where everything comes together and clicks and you are in that rhythm, you are in the flow and you know how to size up. Letting the market put, letting to learn, learn how to, to increase your size without increasing your risk is an incredibly important factor. Take your oh. time. That's and that's that's another thing, right? Give time time. Emo used to say, "Don't eat curry in a hurry," and I thought he was just making fun out of me for eating, getting sick. But get give the market your time. Don't give the market your money. Give the market your time. Take it and use it. You know, I gotta tell you, that's such great advice. And you know, like I said from the beginning today, Pax, you know, you're a warrior in this business. <laughs> you you fought through so much. 
I have so much respect for you. Kids, I love. Yeah, I mean, you're a great dad. You're a great person. You're a great trader, and you're always willing to share your time. I can't thank you enough. And like I said, when I got all those questions, I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to be here all day because that's the great thing about you. You know, is that you will give all the time uh, that you have uh, to help these traders. And uh, you know, I've learned a lot from you in that manner. That's why I love you like a brother, and I respect you. Thank you. And uh, like I said, I appreciate you coming on here today. Everyone's asking for a part two. There's going to be many, many parts of this with Pax and I uh, with these live shows. I thank you to all of you guys joining us today. Uh, quick note, next week is going to be Jared Tendler. I'm going to be live every week, once a week uh, on Wednesdays. This week was uh, was a Thursday. We're going to be trying to go live every week. If you're enjoying the show, please subscribe on YouTube. Hit the like button. Reshared on Twitter. It will be recorded and available on audio as well. Pax, quick shout out to where everybody could find you on Twitter and give everybody the website to, to go and check out what the work you're doing. Sure, Ant, but let me say this. Thank you for providing this platform. Um, you know, I don't know, I, I don't know how anybody would ever the the the, the service that you're providing is invaluable. You know, I, I don't know how traders are able to to find people that that have been through it, you know, um, uh, for, for, so guys, you know, just thank Anthony for this medium and for everything he puts out there. Um, Ira Harris is a great blog called notes from the underground. Um, I'd look that up. You can find me at www.thepaxgroup.org or at paxtrader777 at, I almost said Gmail. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, www.thepaxgroup.org. Um, or Pax Trader 777 on Twitter. I think I have an Instagram account. I, you know, my son <laughs> sends me funny things, but that's it. And thank you for thank you for having me, Ant. And you know you know how much I, I respect you and how much I love you. I'm so glad that we reconnected after a couple of years off. Um, I, I you know I remember not yeah that's all. Right. So thank you. Otherwise, I'll talk for another hour. I know exactly. Oh, I love you too, brother. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Love you guys. See you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a five-star review on iTunes. Never miss an episode. Go to anthonycrudelli.com and get on our email list for show notifications and for free content that is exclusively for subscribers. Also on anthonycrudelli.com, you will find tons of videos and education on trading futures, options, and crypto. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Opinions expressed are solely my own and my guests, and they do not express the views or opinions of my sponsors. Future's radio show is produced by Crudelli Productions.